So today we're doing a pan we're doing a panel. I'm the moderator. My name is Stephanie Southwick, and I run home, uh, I run Property Matters, which is a business where we educate and empower women through real estate. We remove financial barriers by having them learn and take advantage of opportunities to buy properties and buy homes. First homes is one area we work on, or even keeping a home and creating a granny flat. So there's just creative ideas. So I've been doing financial counseling for women, and then sometimes we help some men too, and couples, and so no, no gender bias too much, but the, the focus is on women and empowering them so they can be the person they're supposed to be and not have financial barriers and use real estate as a way to build wealth. And I want to introduce to you our two contest winners from the real estate contest that um, our Orange County Home Ownership Fair has had. And so as you heard, Keely is from Los Angeles and then Steven's from Newport Beach. And I was hoping that you guys could maybe just, um, if I asked you a couple questions, about yourself and what you currently are doing with your time like what would a day look like in a normal work day in your life and as a realtor at, at, at whatever you do right now just kind of give us a picture of what you're doing in your life right now that wasn't on the thing but what's your you know what what are you doing and it could be a hobby it could be a job it could be you know, maybe you're a, a, a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home grandfather. Who knows? I don't know. So I, I, I just you. met them. So, <laughs> so who knows? So, um, yeah. So, Keely, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Sure. Your I work in television okay. for my W-2 job. So that's usually where I am, which is contract work. So, you know, it could be a day to four months at a time of work, and then you look for the next job. Um, and right now, I'm just kind of managing the two properties that I have. Sometimes I take a little bit of a break from TV to try to focus a little bit more on the real estate, but I sort of try to balance both. Um, I do all my investing by myself. I'm not a part of a team, I'm not an agent, I'm just a person. Um, <laughs> and I invest for cash flow in, I live in Northeast Los Angeles and that's where I like to invest. Cool. Love my neighborhood. Hey, how about you, Steven? Tell us about you and what you do during the day and what your average day looks like. Well, uh, my first of all, I'm a real estate broker, so I actually uh, am a broker owner, uh, which means I only come in and agents work underneath me. So uh, uh, I've been doing that for many, many years, about 30 years. And uh, so I manage people, and uh, my thrust of where my expertise is, is in investment and that sort of thing. So even though we sell houses and do all the normal stuff uh, like that, uh, uh, my particular quirky area is building wealth, so. Cool, cool. Well, I'm gonna ask you guys a few things about Back in the day, when you were younger, how old were you when you bought your first piece of property, and what was it? And do you remember how much you paid for that? I know we're all so old now, so uh, yeah, forgive me. I'm just kidding, Keely. But it's, can you tell me a little I bit? I remember. Oh, you do? I do remember. It was okay. 2013, Okay. so I think I was 27-ish. Okay. Uh, and it's the house that I live in now. It's a three unit building. And at the time I rented all three units out and I've since moved in and I live there now. Okay, awesome. And the purchase price was 566.5. Awesome, okay. How about you, Steven, do you remember? Oh, I remember very well, yes. Uh, of course, this was 400 years ago. You have to remember that. <laughs> so they, they were selling these new units. Uh, it was called Timber Scan on the Lake. I'll never forget it. Uh, $12,500, and for $2,000 extra, you, we were able to upgrade to be in Lakefront. So I was all in at $14,500 on Lakefront, one bedroom apartment. Wow. And uh, that was the first one, and I was 18 years old. 18 years wow. old, $14,500. But 18000 today is the same as about roughly 88000 something like that. Oh, that's good to know. Today, yeah. Yeah. So you have to keep that in mind. 
Yeah, future value. And it wasn't California. Oh, you have to, yeah, you have to make it, you have to switch things around to California. Right. So. Okay, so tell me, um, what would you say over the course of your history being a real estate investor and developer or owner, what would you say are, was your biggest money maker and your best decision you've ever made in the life of your in your portfolio now or in the past? What would you say was your best, best investment and money maker? Um, I would say, so I have two multi, small multifamily buildings and I would say renovating them at the beginning was the best decision so that it was as good as I knew I could make it as the tenant was moving in and I didn't have to constantly worry. There's still repairs of course after that, but I think now that I have done it both ways, like going backwards and fixing things mm -hmm. after the fact, and starting from a fresh, newly renovated space is much better if you have the option to do it the second way. Okay, so you're saying to have it completely updated before you get your first rental. That's right. Okay. And then you know what you're working with as, as the years go on. Great. Great advice. I would absolutely agree with that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Plus you get more money in there. Mm -hmm. You can start them off in the right book, right? That's good. Can you guys all hear him back there? Okay, good. Okay, Stephen, so what, and so you agree with her. How about, do you have anything to add? What was your biggest, best decision and money maker? Uh, I think probably to get to know and understand something that maybe you don't know about. It's called a 1031 exchange, and I, I'm very good at those. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if you want me to take two seconds to explain that. Oh, yeah. No. Okay. That I, yes. Can you give us three minutes, and I would love it. 1031 exchange. All right. So all of you know that when you buy a house that you live in, and you sell it, and you have a net profit uh, on it, that money may be taxable if it's over 500000 or over 250000 right? But what if you don't live in the house? What if you are actually investing the property, and you're going to use it for tenants or something like that. So a 1031 is where you can defer, in fact, the actual name, if you want to Google it, it's called a 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange. That's, when you hear somebody like me say 1031, we actually mean that long word, 1031 Tax Deferred Exchange. And basically what it means, and think of it this way, this is the quick way for me to do it in three minutes. The, as you know, you can buy and sell and take advantage of the taxes as long as you've lived in a property two out of the last five years, right? So that means that over a five-year period, you can actually come into two different homes and sell them. You can, you can in theory, make 500000 on two different homes. In other words, make a million bucks tax-free. Wow. Just by rolling it over in this exchange. So what happens is uh, uh, we get into the property for almost nothing. Then as it makes money, the next one we made, let's, let's say we make 400,000 on that one property, then we take that 400 and split it into two, buy two more, and I got one guy, how old is Steve actually, 35, right? 35 years old, he's on his fifth home, and they run anywhere from 400 to a million eight. And he started them all with a one condo, one condo in Irvine for $360,000. And now he owns probably um, close to $10 million worth of real estate, roughly. And he's 35 years old. So and it's all free. tax free. All tax free. Awesome. All tax -free. awesome. How long does it have to be an investment property? Yeah. How long does it have to be a rental before you can 1031? Uh, a lot of that has, there's a two year rule with certain things, but as far as with 1031, it has to be more with the actual cash that you're getting. So there's different, that, that gets into a whole different thing, plus you have to have what's known as an accommodator in the middle of it. There's a little, there's little things to it, but it's not that difficult. It really isn't once you get the basics of it. And so when you see people that, you know, fast forward, in fact, I've got a regular client, a lady over here in Newport, and her husband and she bought money, excuse me, bought property back when they were young. She's, she's in her 80s now, but they bought Orange County property. And she said that they spent a total of $5,000 and they specifically went out and bought 
uh, just land in, in land type places, not in developed areas. And uh, today there's warehouses sitting on all that land and she's worth roughly 85 million, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. wow. Okay, 1031 exchange. So what would you tell the newbie in the room that says, I want to get into real estate as a, as a, as a maybe a way to build wealth? What would you say to a newbie, Keely? I do use real estate to build wealth. That's my goal. My goal is to grow my money through real estate um, as opposed to just having a home that's nice to live in. I like to make it work. So my advice is always make an investment plan that works for you, know what your criteria is, specifically what you want the end result to be and how how day-to-day -day you want it to serve you, and then just go and do it. <laughs> because honestly, you could talk about it and think about it forever, but you have to follow through. Awesome. Okay, what would you say, Stephen, to the newbie who, who says, I want to be Stephen when I'm when I grow up, what well, would you I hope you're at least four foot taller and a lot less <laughs> So, short of that though, you know, first of all, I love what I do. I have loved what I do since I started doing it and I was actually emancipated as a, a I, was, I was legal at 16. I went to court and I became legal. So I, I that's why at 18, I started owning stuff. Um, you know, Real estate, I'm not going to lie to you, real estate, you do have, there's a uniqueness to your personality that I think you have to be, whether you're in the real estate business or just as an individual owning property. If you don't have that certain it factor, we'll call it that, you can still do it. Just be the silent money behind it and, and hire a good agent that becomes your partner for life and still do it. I've got this one guy I was just talking about, his name's Steve also, the 35 year old, he's not even seen most of the property that he owns. So most of it, he just wires money to me and we go out and buy it and he doesn't care because as long as I get the tenant in there and he's getting his check every month, he's a happy camper. So I, I, I you know, I was talking to these two girls over here before, uh, ladies, excuse me, uh, before the session started and I was telling them about avoiding Justin, and Ashley knows who I'm talking about. Justin worked at B of A at 18 years old, and $11 an hour, something like that. And he wanted, at the time, to just stay with his friends, surfing and Dana Point, whatever they were doing down there. And, uh, but he still, he, he just didn't want the white picket fence. He didn't want it for himself. But he wasn't stupid, he wanted to do something with his money. So he started buying for, with 3% down, uh, which is a uh, basically an FHA type loan or something like that. And he started buying property and now fast forward, he's in his mid thirties uh, and his goal was to have three proper, uh, four properties and his, his game plan, and as I was telling him, a lot of people don't know this, but how many of you know that you don't have to double your payments to pay a house off earlier. If you make one extra payment per year, you will cut a 30 year mortgage down to about 16, 17 years. Did you know that? So here's what you do, get the tenant in, let them pay 12 payments. You make one payment a year, make a 13th payment. And what happens is, let's say you're 30 years old, by the time you're 45 or 50, all of it's paid off and now you've just got income coming in. So a lot of these young people, their, their goal is to get themselves in a position where tenants have paid off their house by the time they're 45, money then, the rents all just go into an account, and they use their ATM card and go around the world just visiting whatever they do. And that's, that's their life. And by the way, both of those boys I'm talking about hate cubicles. They don't wanna be in an office environment. They wanna be out and real estate gives you the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. That's great, awesome, I love that. It's freedom, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. freedom, freedom what we want. We don't necessarily want that white picket fence, but we want the freedom. How about your sweet spot? Like if, if somebody's gonna rent from you or rent from the other place down the street, why would they wanna rent from you? What, what do you do that's different? I tend to do just below market apartments so they're nice and they're renovated 
but maybe they're not granite, stainless. I don't have garbage disposals in a lot of mine. Okay. But a lot of people, because of the rental market where I live in Northeast LA, a lot of people just want a place that's more affordable instead of fancier because mm -hmm. the prices are kind of outrageous. Mm -hmm. So rather than going for the tip top luxury, which is, right. you can do that and right. fill your spots easily. I go for, because I started kind of exactly where I would want to be. Mm. You know, like mm -hmm. exactly in my neighborhood, exactly the type of place that I'd be looking for mm -hmm. and put everything, all the amenities in it that I would need as a renter because I was a renter when I first started. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt like there was a need for that. And I feel it's like just under market has everything you need that isn't necessarily for you. Well, you know, I like some of you just said, I think everybody needs to hear it twice. Um, you should mirror yourself. In other words, if you, mm -hmm. if you got into the business, for instance, and you want to be a realtor, these people watch these dang HGTV shows, or Bravo shows. Right. I want to be a star. <laughs> when they are not taping those shows for the you know six yeah. weeks that they tape them, they're just like you and me. Right. They have to work for a living and everything else. It's a show. Remember that this is Hollywood in Southern California. Mm -hmm. So real life though, if you were to get into the real estate business, I always tell people, if if you're like a condo person yourself and you're just starting out, that's who you need. You mm -hmm. sell to people that are just like you, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. people are so stupid. They go out here, they've never even been in a $10 million home, but I want to sell $10 million home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a whole different mentality yeah. there. You sell a $10 million home in a different way than you do the other, but guess yeah. what? There's one commonality. Everybody runs with the, their group of people. So when you see somebody like, um, I think a real good example is everybody know who Josh Flagg is? You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Okay. Josh Flagg grew up in Bel Air. His grandmother was a freaking multi, multi millionaire. She was a, a designer and stuff. Uh, just wherever you guys grew up, my, you know, wherever it was, just as you know people there, Josh knew people in a little place called Bel Air, California. And it just happens that these people buy $40 million homes. But to him, he would be a fish out of water if we brought him down here to Santa Ana. He wouldn't even understand how to do anything that we do down here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'd rather be dumb in Bel Air than dumb down here. So, but at the end of the day, um, uh, if you mirror the, the, you know, your, your market. So if you own an apartment building like she does, then you're going to want tenants that mirror that and your personality should mirror them and then you just kind of grow with them. Mm -hmm. I think that's very good advice. With them. So are you a coach or do you work in real estate? I'm a broker. I'm a real estate broker. Oh, so okay. I buy and sell homes for people as a rule. But I do it for myself yeah. personally too. I've been doing it because my whole life. Because you gain money from that. Hmm? Because you gain money from that. Hmm? In, which mm -hmm. in which capacity? As, as an in, broker. In, well, I'll, actually, I was in a different industry for many years when I first started investing and everything. I got into real estate uh, actually just so that I could buy the homes and, and I had access to the property and, and everything when I first got into it. And then I got out of the other industry and started pouring everything into real estate and then there I stayed. We, we had Century 21 re Remax offices and things like that. So, so did you buy the home and then flip it? I did a lot of that, yeah. But but when I'm all that stuff was both prior to being a broker and continuing as a broker. I love real estate. What was your in, what industry were you in prior to that? Uh, I owned automobile dealership, dealerships. Oh, okay. I, I had three car dealerships. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. So what you guys are saying is to if you're going to go into real estate as an occupation, make sure that you don't spend too much time trying to meet the needs of people that are not like you or don't you'll you'll you don't have to learn as much when you just target your own people you know so yeah. or maybe you're in some field that's exposed you to a certain market and you know that market really well that's that yeah. would be fine too yeah or you know like that's as good. you grow in your yeah. journey to do something different that's just personally the way i started and what ended up working for me to get a foot so. Yeah, I like that. Okay, okay. Well, we ha we have um we still have some more time. I do. 
I know, Stephen, that this was this question wasn't posed to you till the last few minutes, but generational wealth. You know, there's a lot of um, my parents are going to be gone in the next probably 20 years, I'm assuming, they're in their 70s. I don't know, maybe 30 years, hopefully. But how, and they own a house and they own some properties. Um, do you have good recommendations for generational wealth transfer when, when the assets of a family are in, in property and say there's the three of us, me and my brother and my sister, are gonna be inheriting that? Is there anything that you um, would like to tell us so we can tell our parents? <laughs> wow. I mean, I'm in about four weeks. <laughs> <laughs> or is there anything in just generational wealth that you, is your sweet spot that you just say, this is something I want to share? You did share about the, the, um, the 1031 transfer, which is partly very helpful too if you're in the business. What else could you say to people who want to, um, yeah, really do it in a smart way and not lose a lot of money in the transition? Well, remember that everything is about taxes, right? So, uh, or not, not having taxes, I should word it that way. We don't want taxes, so we're right. gonna you, eliminate those as much as possible. <laughs> Thank you, sir. So, uh, more money. Uh, yes, that's right. More money, more money. In your pocket. So that, that's where I like it. Thank you. So we have something in common, don't we? Um, so, you know, the answer to the question, and I'm going to answer this actually from an interesting viewpoint, rather than answering it from the greedy viewpoint of a person that might be inheriting it. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to answer it from a realtor's viewpoint because I get to watch it. I'm okay. going to watch it in real time. Mm -hmm. Do that, please. And I'm yes. going to tell you a very ugly story so that you can appreciate why I'm telling the story. The ugly story is I've got a client that um, when, uh, let me get this straight. So the one lady, her husband had passed away. But when her husband passed away, he was very smart in that before he passed away, he added the lady onto all of his accounts so that when he died, everything just mm -hmm. went over to her automatically. Mm -hmm. not, not even, no problem, right? Mm -hmm. Right. His five kids went crazy, absolutely crazy. And he even went out of his way to film himself stating that uh, he intentionally left one dollar to each one of his kids. Okay, <laughs> this is the Merle thing, you know. So, he left one dollar to each one of his kids. All the wealth went to his wife, okay? So these kids got together and they decided, well, this isn't gonna happen because interestingly enough, this gentleman who died, his mom was still alive. And she lived 52 years in Mexico City. She's from France, loaded with money. And the next scene in this picture is the, I, the, the family gets a call from this uh, nursing home that this grandmother was in. And just imagine this, these <laughs> kids are pushing her down the sidewalk to the bank to get her to put her name, their name, in joint on all their stuff. So that way when she passed, which wasn't gonna be too long, less than a year away, when she passed, all the money would just go to them and no questions asked. So why did I tell you that story? Well, obviously, oftentimes family members are like a bunch of vultures, mm -hmm. which is very sad. It's a very sad thing. Mm -hmm. If any of you have experienced it, it's horrible. Mm -hmm. And it's even more horrible for somebody like me to vicariously go through it with a client. It's terrible. So the reason I told you that story is that as of now, I would, not just because of that, because I, but because I see lots of things like that in my, in my work, I think that I would be go, having family talks is what I would be wanting to do before mm -hmm. it even gets to death and all that. Mm -hmm. And the first place, in fact, the session that was in here before me, when I was in with you uh, in here, um, I actually have many, many times, I have a young person who wants to start getting a real a house or something, and they say they don't have any money, 
and they're not, they don't even think about grandma. They don't even go ask grandma. And you know what I found in my work? 90%, 90% of the time, grandma's happy to help. Nobody mm -hmm. ever asked her. Mm -hmm. And she knows she's gonna die. You know, what your, I guarantee you, once you get in my age group, stuff happens, okay? <laughs> and so all I'm trying to tell you is that a lot of times all you gotta do is ask. Now, why would grandma do that? Well, first of all, it saves grandma taxes. She can get rid of 10,000 a year tax-free. You might be helping grandma while she helps you. The other thing is if you have a smaller family, oftentimes you'll find older people love to just help you grow. There's a lot of emotion to that. I'm not saying be crooked or anything to grandma. I'm just saying share your life with her or him, grandpa. It doesn't matter. So, so with the generational wealth, I think it begins, if you're part of the generation and not in the brokerage side of it, I think that it begins with having a family discuss family business and somebody has to start that conversation and I don't have enough time to write all the bullet points out for you with it, but that's where it would start. Because I can tell you that my experience over my whole lifetime has been old, that older people really do like helping younger people. Mm -hmm. They really do. Mm -hmm. And especially if they got an emotional reason mm -hmm. for it. Like you're my granddaughter. Mm -hmm. That's all the reason I need, mm -hmm. you know? And so um, now if as a broker doing it, I guess in a sentence, um, the, gen the whole concept of generational wealth is different with different ethnicities and different cultures and the way that they believe, you know, I got to tell you, uh, a lot of times uh, people are very foolish with money and, and, uh, and that's not a good thing necessarily, but at the same time, I've seen some really beautiful things. For instance, there's one culture, and I was telling Stephanie about this during the break, when they inherit money, the money is like they're a custodian for it. It's really a beautiful concept. They're like the custodian for the money. It's okay, they can use it and invest it and do whatever, but they don't feel like that, let's say they inherit $10 million. They don't feel like that 10 million is theirs. They're the custodian and it started maybe 500 years ago and it keeps going forward and that's how they treat that family wealth. They, do, they, they treat it with honor, honor. And yet other ones, like I said, are driving grandma down the street to get to her money. Mm. That's I, good I advice. I, I love question. that. That's mm. great advice. Mm -hmm. I think, um, are you going to be around at all later, like afterwards? Because we're going to wrap up. Yeah, no, I'm in case, to, I'm, I'm you know, that, I have a couple more questions about that. But I like what you said about it, it not being, we're just kind of overseeing the money. You know, it's not, it, you know, it's, it's the family's wealth. Which, by the way, is a good way to start a conversation with your family. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to right. be part of that culture. Right. You could just go to your family and right. say... If my mm -hmm. kids said that to me, they're 23 and 24, hey, you know, let's talk about the family wealth. I'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, hey. You know, well, then you yeah. could help me rather than yeah. take from me, but help me manage this, That's right? right. Okay, well, we've got to wrap up, and there's a couple super important things we've got to do, but I do want to give Keely one more chance. Is there anything else you want to share with the group that would help us take that next step in real estate? Because you've done it, and you've been so successful. To take the very next step? Sure, or any <laughs> anything that you've been like, oh, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to say that, and she didn't ask me that. Um, I'm definitely happy to answer questions for a few minutes after the session, but... Um, I always just say that I really believe in real estate, growing your money, and doing good things for you. If you have a good plan and the right team, Lindsay knows about that. Um, go for it. Go for it. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks, you guys. Let's let's say thanks to these contestants. You know, like real real estate cards. And the good news is they won the gift cards. The prize is a $100 gift card. Thank oh you wow. for applying and we are taking hey, let's go to the next room. <laughs> <laughs> and you can buy today. Thank you very much.
for next year, 2021 Orange County Homeowners Tip Fair, we're going to do another panel and you might win or maybe you know somebody who might win. So be sure to go online and sign up for that. And you might, and who knows, you might be able to get a, a hundred dollar gift card too. So thanks for coming, and I think that's about it. And any other questions? Okay, good. We're we're done. Thank you.